the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. all We have come to worship the living God. We have come to worship the Almighty God. We have come to worship the eternal God. Let us pray. Eternal God, author of life and end of our pilgrimage, guide us by your word and spirit amid all the perils and temptations of this life that we may not wander from your way nor stumble in the darkness but may finish our course in safety and come to our eternal rest in you. Through the grace and merit of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. When we pass through deep waters or go through fiery trial, the Lord our God promises to be with us with confidence in God's promise. Come, let us confess our sins. O Lord, you have searched us and known us. You know when we cultivate kindness and our lives bear fruit that blesses the world. You know, too, when our words sow seeds of discord and our actions choke out generosity and grace. When we produce more weed than wheat, forgive us. As we wait with eager longing for your reign to be revealed in our midst, plant within us gifts of love and mercy so that we might live as children of the kingdom and bear fruit that enriches your harvest. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord. 
For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Brothers and sisters, what a wonderful promise that is from God, that God loves us and promises to be with us because we are God's. And God is doing a new thing in us and in the world. We are made new. We are new creations in Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Rejoicing in the new life that we know in Jesus Christ, let us love and forgive each other. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let us greet one another with signs and words of Christ's peace. here at Frederick Presbyterian Church. We are glad you are with us for this 1030 Sunday morning worship service. Our worship begins on each weekend on Saturdays at 5 o'clock for in-person worship and again on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock for in-person worship here in the worship space in the sanctuary in downtown Frederick. If you would like to come and join us for one of those, please come next weekend. If you are new to our worship experience, we are glad you are here and hope that you'll find out more information by looking at the website and becoming a part of the life and ministry of all that happens here as the congregation, the people of Frederick Presbyterian Church. Welcome. Welcome to worship. I invite our children and all of you who are young at heart to join me for our children's time this morning. I want to talk about a game called Hide and Seek. It's a favorite of my five-year-old granddaughter, and when you're my size, it's a challenging game to find a place to hide. But with that said, Hide and Seek, you know, someone closes their eyes, they count, and everyone scurries and finds a place to disappear, and your hope is that no one can find you. Well, we often do that in life, too. Sometimes we do things to others and we know we've done something we shouldn't and we do our best to kind of hide from them. Uh, we do that with parents. We know we have a task to do and perhaps we fail to do it and we think if we hide long enough, it may just go away. Well, believe it or not, sometimes we do that with God. We want to hide and somehow we think that if we just ignore God, uh, all of that may just go away in our journey as well. Well, in a few moments during our scripture lessons, Pastor Eric's going to read the story from Genesis of one of the Old Testament characters named Jacob. And believe it or not, Jacob was hiding too. He thought if he was fleeing from his brother, he couldn't be found. But God found him. And he had a dream about a ladder, a staircase to heaven. It's a great story, and we're going to look at it further this morning. But what I want you to remember is that sometimes we think we're the only ones who are seeking God. When in reality, God is always seeking us. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be open to you so that when you find us, we celebrate. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, 
speak your eternal word that does not change, then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. This our prayer we make through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all, all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm appointed for this morning includes portions of Psalm 139. We read together. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the church at Rome. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope, seen, is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. He put before them <clears throat> another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest and at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds <clears throat> and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and of all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> I hope you have fond memories of our seeing Jacob's Ladder this morning. It's an African-American spiritual. It beckons growth and understanding of one's context and situation and how they might overcome that situation. A very appropriate hymn for us today as we think of the passing of John Lewis, a civil rights icon. The words, well, are important. We're climbing Jacob's ladder, going higher, higher. And we should rise, shine, give God the glory. Obviously, the context for this spiritual is Genesis 28 and Jacob's dream. It's a significant moment for Jacob in his journey because Jacob, too, needed to overcome his situation. Jacob was in trouble, fleeing his brother. Now, I'm not sure what you think of dreams or how you process your dreams if you remember them. Uh, I read a, just a humorous story of a young boy who had some dreams, and parents were talking to him about how important it was to follow your dreams. And in an effort to obey them, he went back to bed. Bad humor aside, I want us to look at Jacob and this important dream of Genesis 28. We need to remember that Jacob is one of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. In fact, he's considered the father of the Hebrew nation. It was Jacob who wrestles with God, and his name is changed to Israel. But just like you and me, Jacob, well, he is complex. 
And to describe Jacob simply as a character may be quite the understatement. What do you say about someone who is deceitful, a a crook, devious, underhanded, untrustworthy? Any other words you want to throw in there, feel free. One of the things we can say positively about Jacob is that when he had his, his dream or his passion, he pursued it with all of his might. Frederick Buechner makes a brief description of Jacob in this way. The book of Genesis makes no attempt to conceal the fact that Jacob was, among other things, a crook. What's more, you get the feeling that whoever wrote up his seamy adventure got a real kick out of them. Twice he cheated his lame brother Esau out of what was coming to him. At least once he took advantage of the blindness of his old father Isaac and played him for a sucker. He outdid his double-crossing father-in-law, Laban, by conning him out of most of his livestock. And later on, when Laban was looking the other way, by sneaking off with not only both the man's daughters, but just about everything else that wasn't nailed down, including the household gods. Jacob was never satisfied. He wanted the moon, and if he'd ever managed to bilk heaven out of that, he would have been back the next morning. For the stars to go with it. Jacob and the context of this interesting character has been our lesson in Genesis for the last several weeks. It really begins back in Genesis 12 with the promise to Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation if he would move from the land he was in to a land God would reveal to him. To be a nation, you need children. Abraham and Sarah had none. But eventually, Abraham has a child by Sarah's handmaiden, Ishmael. And then, fulfilling God's promise, Abraham and Sarah have a son, Isaac. When Isaac comes of age, Abraham sends him back to the land that he came from in order to find a bride. He does. Rebecca is her name. A great love story in itself. Isaac and Rebekah have twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Now the story of Jacob and his brother Esau is rather interesting and it's representative of all families because we we all have our dysfunctions. Esau and Jacob are competitive from day one, even about who would be born first. Esau is the firstborn Jacob clutching to his heel. Esau is what we would call a man's man. The hunter, the athlete, one skilled in the ways of the outdoors. Esau would be riding a big Harley and playing on a World Cup soccer team. Jacob, not so much. Jacob was of a different bent. He preferred hanging around the tents, rather read a good book, probably had a Kindle. He might even be sketching a picture on a canvas or skin. You would also find Jacob in the kitchen preparing meals, listening to the conversations of the adults. We don't know why Jacob and Esau had this intense kind of rivalry. We all know it happens in our families. Some have suggested the tension is found in Genesis 25, 28. Isaac loved Esau because he loved his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Can a parent love one child more than another? Probably not, but we all know that it can feel that way. Some have suggested that some of the legends of Jacob and Esau have been kind of backtracked into the story, honestly, to try to make Jacob look a bit better than he really is. One of those stories is Jacob and Esau as young boys, Esau coming in from the fields, exhausted, wanting something to eat, Jacob having a delicious smelling stew on the stove, pleading with his brother for food, Jacob asked Esau to give him his birthright. And Esau agrees, selling his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Even at a young age, Jacob seems to know what he wants, while Esau could only see the moment. We do know that a number of years later, when Isaac, Jacob, and Esau's father 
was declining in health. His sight was poor. Death was near. He sent his oldest son out to hunt game. Told him if he would make some of his great venison stew, he would be rewarded well. While he was out, Jacob, with the help of his mother, Rebecca, dressed Jacob in skins. Rebecca found stew that she knew her husband would love. And they convinced Isaac that Jacob was Esau. And he gave to the youngest, not the oldest, the family blessing. Esau was distraught, devastated. And he said, once dad dies and the grieving is over, I will deal with my conniving, deceitful little brother. Rebecca and Jacob know clearly what that means, and Jacob flees for his life. It is in that context of fleeing his brother, Jacob has this experience at Bethel. He, he departed so quickly, he didn't even take something to sleep on. He puts his head on a rock, and while he's asleep, he has this vision of a ladder that reaches from the earth to the heaven, and as angels ascend and descend, the Lord speaks to Jacob. I am with you, I will watch over you, and I will bless you. Not a bad word for someone who has stolen the family blessing. Now, <clears throat> Isaac and Esau, Rebecca and Jacob, not the family model I would encourage any of us to emulate but they are very real. The grittiness of this story gives us a glimpse into the dark side of our, our humanity, our willingness to use deceit and really any means we can to often get what we want. The point of this narrative is not the deceit and the thievery, but I want to suggest just a couple of things for you this morning about what we might take away from this story. First, this story tells us something very important about God. This dream of Jacob's ladder, this stairway to heaven, Jacob having this encounter with the divine, comes at a very critical moment for Jacob in his life. Jacob is fleeing, worried his brother will find him. And it, and it should tell us that this God we, we want to, to know and to follow is not very predictable. God will, will not be confined to human ideas and expectations. God behaves in ways that we would perhaps even say are not reasonable or rational. I mean, who would expect God to go out into the wilderness when someone is fleeing for their life and appear to them? It's not a holy place. There's no altar. There's no sanctuary. But yet, God comes to the place where Jacob is. Now, I think this is important for us to hear. For most of the entire sweep of human history, the prevailing assumption has been that it is part of the human experience and responsibility for us to seek God. God is the one who is hiding. We are the ones who are seeking that's what religion is. The organized attempt to pursue and to find and to be in touch with God, the holy, the other, the ultimate. And so human beings have created behaviors designed to access God. We have rituals, liturgies, duties, disciplines, sacrifice. We have built structures for God to occupy Tabernacles, temples, mosques, basilicas, beautiful cathedrals. We've written beautifully and profoundly about God. John Buchanan stated, The human search for the ultimate has been our magnificent obsession. And it has inspired the most sublime art, music, and architecture we have ever created. And along the way, Religion becomes a little too sure of itself, a little too certain that it knows exactly the heart and mind of God, even God's political preferences. Joan Chisticer, a Benedictine sister and author, writes, We can't bear mystery 
We can't abide the beneficence of the unknown. We define the nature of God. We dogmatize the unknown, and we excommunicate people who dare to wonder. This ancient story is full of mystery and unknown. The unpredictability of God invites us to stop our incessant need to organize and rationalize the divine and it invites us to allow some space for God's initiative in our midst. The story invites us to stop asking and start pondering the mystery of this one God who chooses to love every living creature. This unpredictable God who appears in the midst of human life in our most human moments. The appointed psalm this morning, Psalm 139, the Psalter is voicing a prayer. Lord, you have searched me and known me. It doesn't ask anything. It simply ponders the mysterious presence of this God who knows us. That's what comes first. God comes into the world not where we expect God, not only where we build buildings and gather in them. God comes to us when we need Him most. This is important for us to hear. Sometimes we act as though God is only here in this place. Our inability to gather in recent weeks because of the pandemic, well, it's been hard. It's been difficult for all of us. But our inability to meet is about our frustration of not able to be community, to not able to be the people of God gathered. But make no mistake, it in no way limits God's ability to speak to you and to meet you where you are. God may even speak to you virtually through Facebook or YouTube as we stream our worship. <clears throat> and just like Jacob, there is nothing you can do that is so bad, God will not love you. The Lord has searched you and knows you and loves you. And what Jacob came to understand is that God doesn't love people because of who they are, but because of who God is. You cannot do anything so good and wonderful to earn God's love, nor can you do anything so bad that God will stop loving you. It's on the house is one way of saying it's only by grace. Now the second thing we can glean from this is a bit more about our personal journeys. Following your passion does mean discerning what is important. Jacob's quest for the birthright and Esau's casual disregard for his birthright should remind all of us that part of our journey in life is to discern what is of value, what is of importance. What are my gifts? What are my strengths? What gives me meaning? What gives me energy? And dare we ask, what does God want me to be. An essential part of being a parent or a mentor is helping our young people, our children, learn what to value because there are all kinds of forces, people, organizations who want to try to influence your decision about what to value. But ultimately each one of us must choose what is valued above all the things vying for our attention and how you will follow that calling, that passion, that dream. Scripture is a record of such dreams. Abraham following this call of God to go to a land that God would reveal because of a covenant promise. David as a boy going out to fight a giant who mocked his God. Saul who became Paul jumping off of the ambition train to serve the God he was persecuting. What is your passion? 
And is God a part of what you value? John Claypool describes Jacob as riding straight with crooked lines. And the reason Jacob's lines are, well, we know why they're crooked. The reason they become straight is because of God. God is a part of his journey. And it's why Joseph, if you remember, could tell his brothers who sold him into slavery what you intended for harm, God intended for good. It's why we celebrate God's grace rather than God's justice in our lives. Frederick Buechner also said of Jacob, it wasn't holy hell that God gave him, but holy heaven. Not to mention the marvelous lesson thrown in for good measure. The lesson was, needless to say, that even for a dyed-in-the-wool, double-barreled con artist like Jacob, there are a few things in this world you can't get but can only be given. One of these things is love in general. The other, the love of God in particular. Jacob begins a journey that will change his name to Israel. The grandson of Abraham, Jacob, the scoundrel in so many ways, becomes the father of a nation. His is a journey with God. Our journey can be with God's blessing as well. May this be so for you and for me. Let us bring the needs of the church and the world to God's loving care, saying, For your love and goodness, we give you thanks, O God. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for our salvation, for your love and goodness, we give you thanks, O God. For the peace of the world, for the unity of the church of God, and for the well-being of all peoples, for your love and goodness. 
for this gathering of the faithful and for all who offer here their worship and praise for your love and goodness. For all the baptized, for all who serve in the church, our elders and deacons, those who teach and lead, our mission efforts to help others, the ministries of this church, for your love and goodness, for our elected officials, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, for your love and goodness, for Frederick, Maryland, for those we call neighbor, and for all who live here as they are our neighbors, for your love and goodness, <clears throat> for the good earth that God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, for your love and goodness, for those who travel, that they will be safe. For time away with family and with you, O God, even in the midst of pandemic, may we find strength and renewal. For your love and goodness, for those who are aged and infirmed, for those who are widowed and orphaned, for those who are sick and suffering, for your love and goodness, <clears throat> for those who are poor and oppressed, for those who are unemployed and destitute, for those who are imprisoned and captive, and for all who remember and care for them, for your love and goodness, for your presence in our times of need, for your faithfulness in pursuing us with your love. For grace, your free gift. For your love and goodness. Yes, Lord, for your love and goodness, we give you thanks. Continue, O God, to guide and direct us, especially as we continue to find our path through this pandemic. Help us that we might find your will and way for our lives. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Now in unity, let us pray as our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, out of great thanksgiving for all God has provided, let us return to God our offerings, our tithes, our gifts, our service, our lives.
The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious Father, giver of all good things, for our home on earth and for your unfailing grace and mercy, we give you thanks. Christ, our Redeemer, for your sacrifice on the cross and rising from the dead that we might live, we give you thanks and praise. Holy Spirit, giver of life, for your abiding presence in our lives and for comforting and guiding us along the way. We give you thanks, praise, and glory. O blessed triune God, to you be glory and praise now and forever. Amen. May God, who creates, redeems, and sustains, keep you steadfast in faith, alive with hope, and abounding in love. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God has called you to be in the world, showing and telling others the good news of God's love. Therefore, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 